Yes, we'll go ahead and get started now. What we're going to begin on today is we're going to start factoring equations, quadratics. This is a sheet, one of the two that you'll need to have out. In this particular sheet, it gives some rules of factoring. It also gives some rules of signs. Now, I'm going to enlarge these a minute, but this bottom one's going to get covered over by that piece of wood when I do. Okay, there we go. And there's a square after that AX right up at the very top. Now, I'm going to rewrite this bottom one. If the signs are A plus or minus B minus C, then the format, your answer, your factored answer will be in will be whatever minus first term and last term and whatever plus equals zero. In other words, you're going to have opposite, oops, I left out something. You're going to have opposite signs on your two parentheses, whereas on the other two rules, you had the same signs, either both plus or both minus. Now, the method that I'm going to show you today is probably not one you've ever seen anywhere unless you've had Paul Johnson as an instructor. He learned the system indirectly through me, a teacher that he had taught it to him uh, because of a seminar that I taught and presented this many, many years ago. Uh, now, on this system, this is one I developed myself, and it's a little more logical than other systems. You do not have to use my system. If you're comfortable with the AC method or some other method of factoring, that's fine. You'll get full credit for steps shown in those methods. However, I think you'll find that this method is a little easier and certainly a little faster in most cases. Now, you see the rules of factoring here. Just like any of them, no matter what system it is, if you have a common term in all parts of the equation, you want to factor it out first. Then, see if any like terms can be combined. In other words, we're just simplifying the equations before we start. Now, my second rule. Look at these rules of signs up at the top, okay, to determine the sign of your answer. Okay, these are called factors, what you've got in parentheses after you factor it. Okay, so in other words, if both of the signs in the problem in the quadratic, and I'm just listing the A, B, and C, the, the, the real numbers, I'm not worried about the variables in the problem right now, but if the two signs in the quadratic are both positive, then when you get it factored, both factors will be a positive in the middle. If both of them are negative, excuse me, if the, the B term is negative and the C term is positive, then both of them will be negative. Now, what's the common denominator of this statement? If the C term is positive, both signs will be the same, either positive or both negative. Now, for this one, if the C sign is negative, no matter what the first one is, then one of your factors will be negative and one of your factors will be positive always. 
So that gives you a big hint on what your factored answer's got to look like. Okay? Now, this kind of problem I call different signs problems. Okay? Different signs because your answer is going to have different signs. Those two I call same signs. And I'm going to use some colloquial language in the process of doing this. Now, let's go down to my part A. Look for multiple pairs of the A term. For example, in any of these three styles, let's say that A were six. Well, the multiple pairs that I'm referring to here would be one times six and two times three. Those are the only possibilities of a way you can get six. Now, if you had 12, you could have one times 12, you could have two times six, and three times four, or the reverse of each one of those. Then we're going to do the same thing with the C term. We're going to find the multiple pairs that make up the C term. So that's the first things that you do. Now, I'm going to have to demonstrate this, find the possible cross product with the combinations. We'll do that in just a moment. And then you can see these other rules. If you've got this printed out where it's convenient to you, then you'll see that it makes a little sense when we get started on it. Okay. Now, you also need this handout. Your, your handout doesn't look quite like this one. Your handout looks like this. Okay, but these A through E terms are what I have up here on the board. A, B, C, D, E. Now, what these are is these are shortcut patterns for factoring. And what they say is if you have a perfect square on the first term, if you have a perfect square on the last term, then two times the first term times the last term equals that. Now, you would actually in this problem start with this, and that would be a plus b times a plus b. Here, the only difference in the first one and the second one is they're minuses. So you would have a minus, A minus B, A minus B. Here, you've got an A squared minus a B squared. That's our conjugate pair we discussed last Friday and once before, okay? And what happens when we get a conjugate pair? It always looks like this. First and last term the same different signs. And this one is a huge shortcut for you. Then a little later on, we'll get into the ones with the uh, difference of cubes and the sum of cubes. Now, I've got a number of problems here that I want to uh, go over with you, just examples, to show you how to use this system that I, that I developed. We're going to start with problem number three up in the upper right hand corner, which is x squared plus 5x plus 6 equals 0. Okay, and we want to solve this or factor it and get the solution. Now, for right now, I just, I'm not going to worry about. I'm not going to worry about the uh, solution on it. All I'm going to worry about is factoring it. There's a hidden one in front of this one. So, using my steps, 1 and 1, 1 times 1, is the only way you can get that term. This one, 1 times 6, 
and two times three are possibilities. So we set these down. We're dropping out the variables for right now, but they're really there. The first equation, we would have a one, and let's choose a two. I'm gonna choose this pair. The second, from the uh, second of these, I choose a one, and then I have to choose the three. Now on my sheet, where it said cross product, and I'm referring to rule number four on this sheet handout I gave you. What we're going to do is we're going to multiply these two values. In other words, when we distribute, you know how we do the two inside and the two outside values when we're uh, foiling? Well, basically, that's what this is doing. We're just checking the middle term to see if it's correct. So in this case, I would get a two. In this case, I would get a three. That's pretty simplistic, I admit. Now, because we have a problem that has the same terms, I would add those two terms together. Two plus three is five. Does this five match that five? Yes, it does. So we know that this is the correct arrangement of these values. Now, this five has to be a positive. And likewise, because all of the signs are positive, so are these. So what that means for us then is here, are our sets of factors, which would be x plus 2 and x plus 3. That would be the two factors that you would get when you factor that equation. Now, if you look at this, if they are both plus, and because of the same signs integer rule, same signs you add, different signs you subtract and take the sign of the biggest. Well, same signs, we're going to add these two cross products and just a shortcut if this is a one up here, well, two plus three makes five. We got it with it and we can do this problem actually without even working it. Okay, let's look at the next example. Let me write this answer down here x plus 2 and x plus 3. Okay, my next problem that I want to work is uh, I'm going to try number 2 up here, which has a minus on the b term and a plus on the c term. So x squared minus 5x plus 6 is what we're going to try to factor. Now, if you notice, we really have the same numbers. The only difference in these two problems is one has the plus there, one has the minus there. My answer down here at the end, both of these have to be minuses. Okay? because of the rules I had on my first sheet. Okay, factors again, one and one. Here, one and six, two and three, just like before. I bring down the one and the one. And over here, I already know it, so I'm gonna choose the, I'm gonna choose the one and the six just to intentionally get a wrong answer. I cross these two. I cross these two, a one. Now, I have to add because these are both going to be the same sign based on my rule sheet. Well, one and six make seven. Eh, can't be. 
So that's how you kind of check yourself to see if your answer is correct. So let's try the two and the three or the three and the two. It doesn't matter the order if these two are the same. So here I get a two, here I get a three. I have to add those two because they are same signs according to my rules of signs. Once again, I get a five. Now, the difference is in that problem and this problem is since that's a negative, this must be a negative. And since they're same signs, both of these must be same signs. Now, this sign here always carries up to right here, always. This sign right here always carries to the top pair, always. So what do we got? We got 1x minus 2, 3 in this case, and 1x minus 2. And of course, that or this, the order, I, I can put this one in front and that, I can reverse the order of those since these two parentheses are multiplied. Now, that's the simple ones. Now, I'm going to leave that one up again, and I'm going to go to a third problem. And this time, I'm going to go to problem number four. Look at our rules of signs for it. Our rules of signs for it, we got x squared minus 7x minus 8. Well, because that C term is negative, we know that our answer, one of these has to be a positive, and one of these has to be a negative in our answer. So this is a different signs problem. So the first thing, I've got a 1 and a 1 for my first terms. Now, I've got a choice of 1 and 8, 2 and 4, and that's really the only choices that can make up 8. If I look at these, now on this one, because they are different signs instead of same signs, I'm going to subtract. Look at these two. One mi 8 minus 1 is 7. Ding. Or 1 minus 8 is negative 7. Ding. 2 and 4 make 6, or make 2 when you subtract them. So this one can't work. So why even bother with this one? So I'm going to put in the 1 and an 8. I'm going to do my cross products. I get the 8. I get the 1. Now, here's the important step on different sign problems. Well, first of all, I subtract these two, and I get a 7. Take the little one from the big one, use the sign of the biggest. Now, because we have to use, this has to be a negative because of this, I have to take this negative to the biggest of these two products, which would be this one. So if this one's positive, then that one must be, excuse me, if this one is negative because sine of the biggest, then this one is positive. So the negative sign goes here, the positive sign goes here. And it does matter which one of these are which. So let's write this problem, 1x, plus, oh, and 1x plus 1, and 1x minus 8. So there's our answer. I'll give you a moment to copy that. Okay, now I'm going to do this problem number 8. x squared minus 4x minus 1. 
Well, you know what? We look at this thing. We got a one and a one here, and the only thing we can have is a one and a one there. Because of that sign, we're going to have to subtract. But if this is a one and that's a one, the only answer I can possibly get is zero, and that does not match my middle term. So this problem is what we call prime. There are equations which cannot be factored. We'll learn a way to deal with them, a couple of ways of dealing with them a little later in the course. But this one happens to be prime. So let's go on to another problem. Let's look at number five, x squared plus 6x plus minus 9. Okay. I look at this thing. I've got a 1 and a 1 for the A terms. Now, my choice is out here, 1 and 9, 3 and 3. I know that I'm going to have to subtract because of the C term sign. Well, huh, what can I get? Let's try the three and the three. Here I get three, here I get three. I subtract those, I get zero. And won't work. Let's try the one and the nine. I get a 9, I get a 1, I subtract those, and I get an 8. <coughs> Excuse me. Won't work. Well, we've got another prime example here. Okay, now, I've got another problem that I want to use. Actually, I wrote that number five wrong in the, uh, it's actually supposed to be a plus, but what we found out, if that's a minus in front of the nine, then yes, it is a uh, prime item. Now, in terms of problems that I have on here, we're going to go to a next higher level on the next problem. So far up to this point, all of the problems that I've chosen have had ones in front of the X. But this one that I'm going to use two X squared plus three X minus 20. Okay, what do we know about our answer? Well, it's got to have a, one term's going to be a minus, the other term's got to be a plus. So we know that about the answer already. The only way you can get two is one times two, so I'm going to bring those down. Now, 20 has a number of choices. One times 20, two times 10, uh, four times five. Those are all variations with, of course, the reverse of them. Because that's a negative, we know that after we do our cross product, we're going to have to subtract. Now, so let's try to pick out something. Since we're going to be subtracting, we don't want really huge numbers, probably. But what happens if we use the 4 and the 5? I'm going to put the 5 and the 4 here. I just randomly pick that. 1 times 4 is 4. 5 times 2 is 10. If I subtract 4 and 10, I get 6. And eh, doesn't work. So that means that that's not a correct pair to use. 
What if I have switched the order, five and four? Four times two is eight. And one times five is five. I subtract five and eight and I get three. Ding. So I've got the correct answer. Now I've got to find how my signs belong. In this case, this three has to be positive. Sign of the biggest is here. So that one's the negative. Here goes the negative, here goes the positive. So my answers are 2x minus 5 and 1x plus 4. Now, when you've got the different signs, and, and when you've got different, well, as long as there were ones, it didn't really matter which order you put them in on the, the right side. But if the front A number, the A number, is anything besides a one, you can go ahead and write down a pair of factors for it, but it does matter which order the C side is in. So this is a method of, of factoring that you can use that might be useful to you. Let's try another one of these. Um, four X squared plus eight X plus one. Four X squared plus eight X plus one. What do we know about the answer? Well, in this case, they're both going to be the same and they're both going to be plus. Down here, I'm going to have a plus because that's a plus. Now, what are my choices for four? I've got a choice of one times four, two times two. What are my choices over here? I got a one and a one. Well, duh, I'll put those down. I need to scoot this a little farther down. Okay, now, by using this one over here, the same number, the order, which one's on top, which one's on bottom, doesn't matter. I'm going to try, I've got to have an eight. So I need something fairly big. Well, let's try the one and oh. One times eight, excuse me, those are my possibilities. Let's try one times four. Here I get four, here I get one, they give me five. That will work. Okay? Let's try the two and the two. Here I get a two, here I get a two, and I get a four. Well, that one won't work either. So what is this one? This one is a prime example. Now, let's, uh, let me put up another problem. And I'm going to try to make this one up in my head and make one up real quickly so that it doesn't come up with prime. I'm going to use I'm going to use a 4x squared And out here, I'm going to use an 8, okay? And uh, let me think on this. If I wanted to end up, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking out loud to you right now. If I wanted to use this pair on the front end, and I wanted to use this pair on the back end, because the choices for eight are one, 
times eight, two times four, or the reverse of that. And of course, here you've got one times four and two times two. Now, I'm trying to make up the problem is what I'm doing right now and make it up correctly. Now, I want a minus sign right here to make this one a little more challenging. So that means that I'm going to have to subtract down here. Okay, two times four is eight. One times four is four. Eight minus four is four. So I've got to have a four X out here. Now, which sign does it need to be? Well, that depends on what I put in here. Okay. If I want that to be a negative sign, then I would have to put the negative there and the positive here. And I would get 1x minus 2 and 4x plus 4. Okay? Now, what if that would be if this were a minus here? What if this were a plus here? If that were a plus there, then this one would have to be the plus. This one would have to be the minus. And here would be your signs. Okay. So if we started this from scratch, we could figure out these now, we could make all kinds of mistakes. If we put a 2 and 2 in there and we worked it down, we'd find out that that won't work. If we had put a uh, 1 and an 8 over here, we would have found out it doesn't work. If we had put a 1 and a 4 here and a 4 and a 1 there, it would not work. But when you get the right combinations of these factors, do the cross product and either subtract them or add them to get the middle term, then you can get the right product. Now, we come to solve the zero, the quadratic equations by the zero product rule. Okay? Now, all I've done up to this point is I have solved equations, okay? But each one of these on my original sheet, I didn't finish this one, did I? Well, this one wouldn't work. Let's go back to that number three that we started with, or number four, x squared minus 7x minus 8 equals 0. Okay, on this one, 1 and 1. And we tried the 8 and the 1 here. Because that's a minus, we have to subtract. So here our cross product is 8. Here our cross product is 1. Sign of the biggest has to be negative, well, subtract those is 7. So I've got a negative 7, so sign of the biggest is the 8 here. So I get these two factors, 1 minus 8, or 1x minus 8 times x plus 1, and then equals 0. Now, once we get to this step on these problems, the zero factors rule just has one more step. The one more step that you've got to do on this is you take each one of these times zero. Now, there's a rule that says if A times B equals zero, one of these two has to be zero. We don't know which one, okay? Or they both could be zero. 
And that's why we can do what we're about to do. So I write two equations from this. I write x plus 2, that's a plus sign, equals 0. And for this one, I write 4x minus 4 equals 0. So that gives us two equations, one based on each of these separate factors set equal to 0. Subtract 2, subtract 2, and I get x equals negative 2. Over here, I subtract, or I add 4, add 4. That gives me 4x equals 4. I have to divide each side by 4. And I get x equals 1. Okay, I've got this answer, and I've got this answer. Now, you can write your final answer as x equals negative 2 and 1, or you can write it as negative 2 and 1, the set containing those. Okay? For this problem, similar, x minus 8 equals 0, x plus 1 equals 0. Add 8 to both sides, and you get x equals 8. Over here, subtract 1 from each side, and you get x equals negative 1. Or, in set notation, 8, negative 1. So that's the only thing left on this, is to use the, they call it the zero products rule. Because the product of these two things equals zero, so one or the other or both have to be equal to zero. That brings us to our next topic. We do not complete, we're going to solve quadratic uh, equations by using the square root property. But here's some more of these problems. Here's an equation. Now, they're going to work it a little differently than I did. How would I work this equation? Well, I would say that I have factors of 1 times 2 is the only possibility on the A term. For the C term, I've got the possibilities of 1 times 15 and 3 times 5. So, I put down my 1 and my 2 because those are the only choices there. I look at my rule of signs and I know that down here I'm going to have to subtract. Okay, in this case for the 15, I'm going to be doing some subtracting. I'm going to try the 3 and the 5 because that 1, there's a hidden 1 in front of this x, is a very small number. Now, I could choose 3 and 5. That's 6, that's 5, you subtract them, you get 1. What would happen if I put the 5 on top? Well, here I would get 10 and I would only get 3, which is 7. So you see the order when you don't have uh, a 1 for the first term does matter. Okay, so I multiply these and I get 5. I multiply these and I get 6. I subtract them and I get 1, which is the middle term I want. Now, having gotten that, 
the sign of that one has to be positive. So I use, since I'm subtracting, I use the sign of the biggest, goes there and here. So there are my two factors. So I've got x plus 3 times 2x minus 5 equals 0. I've now got this factor. I have to use the zero products rule. x plus 3 equals 0. 2x minus 5 equals 0. Minus 3 minus 3. x equals negative 3. Over here, plus 5 plus 5 and 2x equals 5. Divide by 2, divide by 2, x equals 5 abs. So how would I write that in set notation? It would be the set with negative 3 and 5 abs. Now, I'm going to show you their solution. Okay. They didn't show how you factor that. They assumed you know how to factor. Okay. College algebra assumes you already know how to factor. For those of you who may have had troubles with factoring, by the way, when I took high school algebra, factoring was my greatest nightmare. My math teacher told me, well, you just try different numbers in them in combinations with pluses and minuses until you get the right one. The guess by guess and by golly method. Well, I despise that method. And the reason that I came up with this method that I've been showing you today is I wanted to have some sort of logical way that I could find out the answer rather than just doing a whole bunch of guessing and trying them out, guess and check. Well, anyway, on this problem, they did go ahead and factor it, got the same solutions we got, okay? And this term produces the five halves like we did, and that one produces the negative three. I just showed you how I got those two values. So there was your solution. Now, I had the negative 3 first and the 5 halves second. Does not matter, okay? Doesn't matter. Okay, here's another problem. 24x squared minus 8x. Let me bring it down. 24x squared minus 8x, okay? Now, all they're wanting us to do on this one or equals, rather, 8x, okay? We've got some, simple, some manipulation to do on this one before we can actually solve it. First thing we gotta do is we take this 8x on the other side. So we get 24x squared minus 8x plus zero equals zero, all right? Now, on this problem, we really don't need this plus zero, but we can factor out an 8x out of both of these terms. 8x into 3x minus 1. In other words, what I'm doing in reality is I'm dividing this term by 8x to get there, here, out, I pulled it out. And I've divided this term by 8x, or, and so 8x goes into this 3x times, and 8x goes into this, that should be an x, not an 88. That should be one time, okay? It doesn't just go away. 
So that means this thing has factored into here. This, what we did on this problem, goes back to my first rule of factoring. If you share a common term, factor it out first. This shared a common term of 8x, so I factored it out first. Now, at this point, I use the zero products rule just like I did over there, only I've got 8x equals zero, and I've got 3x minus one equals zero. Well, divide eight, both sides by eight, and you get x equal zero. Okay, here's a shortcut. Anytime you got a variable out here by itself, it doesn't matter whether it has a, a number in front of that variable or not, it's going to give you a value of x equals zero. Okay, now this one, plus one, plus one, so 3x equals one, divide by three, divide by three, x equals one third. Here are your two solutions. So your solution set is zero, one, third. Okay. You see, they factored it and got the same thing we did. I just showed you how I got that because this is not really a necessary step right here to show that division on both sides. And they got the zero and the one third like I did. And the solution set. Okay, here's three more problems. Well, actually, it's about time to stop for the day. We only have two minutes left. Okay. I want you to try to work the first problem yourself, and then I will work the second problem before we leave. We'll go over the first problem first thing tomorrow. Ten times quantity three x squared minus thirteen x equals negative forty. Okay, I've got to distribute this ten, so I get thirty x squared minus one hundred thirty x equals negative 40, which I want to take on the other side. So 30x minus 130x squared uh, plus 40 equals 0. Now I look at this, and I can factor that 10 out of everything again. So I get 3x squared minus 13x plus 4 equals 0. I'm just going to bring the 10 down, and I'm going to factor this. Rule of sign says that they're both going to be negative. Okay, in this case, a 1 and a 3 and I can either use a one and a four or a two and a two. Anyway, I do it, I've got to come up with a 13. And I've got to add to get that 13. Well, if I look at this, if I take a four times a three, that's a 12, then I'd have a pair of ones. So I'm gonna have four and one in this order. Okay, so here I get 12, here I get 1, I add them and I get 13, ding, and everything has to be negative on this problem. So I get 1x minus 4 and 3x minus 1 
and this 10 times it, okay? When I try to use the zero properties factor, that 10 is a non-player. So I have x minus four equals zero and three x minus one equals zero. Plus four plus four x equals four. Plus one plus one three x equals one divide by three x equals one third. So my solution set is four and one third. Okay. So you see we had to get this over on that side first, but before we could take the, I left out a parentheses there. Before we could take this over here, we had to distribute that 10 or we could have divided both sides by 10 to, to start with to get rid of that 10 altogether and gone straight to this step. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow, hopefully. Um, I'm probably gonna be here on campus, but again, because of the weather, I'm gonna give all of you a break and just say no one come on campus, just watch it from home where you're or your dorm room or whatever, so you'll be comfortable the rest of this week. I don't want to put you to hazard. So uh, with that, I'll say goodbye. <laughs>